OK? From the back? Yeah? All right, awesome. Uh, so thank you for Im the invitation. Um, it's been a long way. So Martin already introduced me, but I'm Alan. I'm actually from uh, a small country in South America called Uruguay, which I don't know if you have even heard about. But um, most of our work is done for clients in Silicon Valley. So we have a lot of experience um, doing machine learning for the past eight years. And you can follow me on Twitter. And you can talk to me wherever you can find me here. I'm very open to discussing stuff with people. So um, I'm going to start with a little story. Uh, raise your hand if you know the comic XKCD. Nice. OK. So maybe this is familiar to you. This was published in 2014, actually September 2014. And it says, it's a discussion between two people. When a user takes a photo, the app should check whether they're in a national park. Sure, easy geese lookups, give me a few hours, and check whether the photo is of a bird. I'll need a so in CS, it can be hard to explain the difference between the easy and the virtually impossible. And the caption of this was something really interesting, which was, in the 60s, Marvin Minsky, who was one of the fathers of uh, AI, assigned a couple of undergrads to spend the summer programming a computer to use a camera to identify objects in a scene. He figured they'd have the problem solved by the end of the summer. Half a century later, we're still working on it. So why was this problem so hard for Minsky students in the 60s? I mean, it should have taken like a summer. But we're in 2018, so let's uh, fast forward. I actually did some code for this conference, and I built a program called Bird or Not, which you can clone uh, the repository there. And this program actually tells you if a picture is of a bird or not. And it's built in Python. It uses uh, the Keras library, which I don't know if you have heard about, but it's a very nice library for doing these sort of things. Um, it uses something called ImageNet, which we're going to talk briefly about. And basically, it's under 50 lines of code. So what Minsky students couldn't solve uh, in like half a century, <laughs> we uh, can solve now with less than 50 lines. And actually, the, uh, the, the main uh, things of the program is just these uh, less than um, seven lines. So there we're building like a model. We do some magic. We load the image. We do some preprocessing. And then we just call predict. And then to call predictions. And that will tell us what uh, the image is about. So this problem that was like really, really hard for a long time is now real. So what I'm going to uh, talk about today is a little bit about the intuition of how uh, is it that this problem is much easier now. What techniques have we developed to make it easier? So how computers process images, basically. And then I'm going to jump to talk about um, how modern object detection works. I'm going to give you also the intuition so you can uh, try to understand uh, not, not only how it works, but why it works. And this is not going to be like a super technical talk in the sense that you're gonna, not going to see like a single math formula there. I actually prefer to um, face the challenge and keep this like for general public. So. Um, I hope I succeeded in that. Um, and at the end, I'm going to present Luminov, which is a Python toolkit that we built for doing object detection. And you're going to see um, a little bit how it works. So image classification. Uh, what are we talking about when we say image classification? It's actually very simple. I take a picture, and you've got to tell me what that picture is. You're going to classify it between a discrete set of labels. So um, you have like your set of labels. The picture can, can be a bird, can be uh, a tree, can be a dog, can be a car. But it can only be one of the things at the same time. So that's uh, image classification. Um, and now, uh, so what is so hard about image classification? Why did it take more than half a century to kind of solve it? The problem is that when we see this beautiful picture of this bird, um, when I translate that for computer language, what I'm actually seeing is a giant matrix. So for each one of the color channels, red, green, and blue, I have this uh, giant matrix of full of numbers, which tell us the intensity of each uh, pixel. Okay? So if you were to think about, for me, it's really easy to see and discover that this is a bird. I mean, we all humans can get really good at pattern recognition. But actually, for a computer, if I had to program like the rules to say if this giant uh, array of numbers is a bird, or, or it's a car, or it's a person, then uh, I'm going to have a big problem. So at first, if you try to think about like rules, then that approach wouldn't work. Um, 
So th there are many, many variations of birds, like um, many things that look completely different can be a bird. So how do you encode all that knowledge in a giant uh, if, else, if, else, if, else, looking at the regions of pixels? So it's very, very hard. So what people have done is actually use the machine learning approach. So how does this work? High level. Many of you, of, of course, are, are familiar uh, with machine learning from what I've learned in the past two days. But this basically works like this. You take a bunch of images of birds. You label them as birds. You take a bunch of images of them as not birds. So this constitutes your data set. Okay? You need to gather all these pictures and label them. Then you actually run your data set through an algorithm. In particular, I'm going to talk about convolutional neural networks a little bit. And then uh, this algorithm kind of learns how to birds from the things that are not birds. So that gives you a trained model, which you can use to make predictions about images that you haven't seen before. Okay? So this kind of trained model encodes the knowledge of what constitutes a bird and what doesn't constitute a bird. Um, this approach is called supervised learning. Because, as you see, I need to manually label the images in my data set. So I need kind of a teacher that knows what is a bird and what is not. Um, OK, so a brief, super brief introduction to neural networks. Um, you can think about a neural network as a, basically a model that let us represent functions. It's like a really simple model, and it has existed for a long time. Actually, um, the first, uh, the perception, I think, was introduced in the 40s. So it's, it's a model um, that is like loosely inspired in the functioning of the brain. If somebody tells you that it's trying to copy the brain, they're lying. It's like super, super simple. Um, and basically, it's a, a bunch of linear uh, transformation followed by something called activation functions that are not linear. So we stack those things in layers. And from the input, we uh, apply successive transformations to that until we end uh, a, a final, um, with a final value. Okay? So, um, in particular, these, um, these neural networks were very useful in the 80s, but then they kind of fell uh, out of fashion because other simpler techniques um, work better. However, they had like a comeback, and I'm going to talk about that. Um, in particular, this uh, architecture called convolutional neural networks, which were uh, invented by Jan LeCun, who works now at Facebook. Actually, he's the chief AI uh, researcher at Facebook. You might have heard about him. So this architecture is very, very good at pattern recognition with minimal preprocessing. What do I mean uh, by this? Actually, before, uh, people used to pre-compute stuff originating from the images and feed that uh, pre-computed thing into a classification algorithm. So uh, instead of just feeding the raw pixels, they would actually compute like, uh, something like border detection, color gradients, and such. So the image was kind of simplified in a way that it let an algorithm actually learn useful things about that. But this architecture convolutional neural network kind of superseded all that because it's working like so good now that, um, that we don't need to do the, the manual preprocessing anymore. So you've seen uh, in yesterday's keynote, the Lenet, which was responsible for um, detecting handwritten digits in the 90s. Um, so OK, we're going to kind of understand uh, how a convolutional neural network works. And for that, we need first to talk about what is a convolutional filter. So basically, think about a filter as a magnifying glass that looks at a tiny, tiny region of the image, no more than a few pixels, like 3 by 3, 5 by 5, 7 by 7. So at a time, you're only looking at a very, very small section of the image. And what the filter is going to do is this filter is configured to detect a specific pattern. Okay? So in this case here, we have a filter that uh, actually detects like a diagonal line, another one that is configured for detecting a vertical line, and this for the color green. Okay? So what, it, what will happen is that if, um, if I look at a tiny region of the image, these filters will activate more strongly based on whether the pattern is present on that tiny region of the image. So if the filter activates, then it means that that region of the image kind of looks like the pattern of the filter. And if it doesn't, it's because not. So for example here, um, if I look at the, um, at the beak here of the bird, uh, and I zoom in enough, I can see that it kind of looks like a diagonal line. So, Actually, this filter would be uh, strongly activated in that uh, particular region. However, if I take the same filter and I zoom in in this other particular area, then this filter wouldn't activate as strongly. Um, 
So here it lets, uh, it lets you kind of summarize the information of this particular small region of the image. And the interesting thing about the filters is that if I, um, if I take more than one filter looking at exactly the same region, I can uh, detect combination of patterns. So for example, here uh, I have these two inverse diagonal lines. And if I look at a simple region, a single region with those two filters, then I can detect this kind of edgy uh, border. Okay? So the combination of different filters let me detect uh, more complex patterns in a single region. So I have convolutional filters. I kind of look at a small three by three regions, so, so to speak. So the uh, next step is actually, why don't we actually slide those filters to look at the entire image? Okay? So that is the convolution operation. And this is the key to pattern recognition. Like everything that uh, involves modern pattern recognition relies in some way or, not, or another in uh, this operation of convolutions. So what, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take the original image, um, and I'm going to look at three at each uh, three by three region with the same to produce uh, what is called an activation map. So in this case, I, I kind of pad the image to the image, so I keep the same image resolution spatially. Um, because if not, it will be like smaller uh, when I look at a 3 by 3 region. Um, so here, by taking one single filter, each filter gives me uh, an activation. In, in each 3 by 3 region of the image, how strongly did that particular filter activate? Um, so basically, if I do that with some particular filter over the image of the bird, I might get something that looks like this. So this is one particular filter, and this is another filter. You see that the first filter kind of, uh, you could say that it kind of resembles a, an edge detector. It's kind of detecting borders of, uh, of the bird, of the, um, the stick. And the other, um, the other filter, you would say that intuitively, if you react reacting to the color brown or to some texture like resembling the stick and some parts of the bird, but uh, sometimes it's like really hard to, to see what exactly is this filter doing. Um, notice something that the size of the image doesn't matter. So um, if you have heard that image classification uh, requires square images, you are right. But in this case, when we're doing convolutions, um, the, actually the size of the activation map can vary. This wide and this uh, tall, then you're going to get an activation map which is the same uh, dimensions. So uh, we don't need square images to produce a meaningful activation map. Um, so the interesting thing is that why do I need to stop at looking at the original image? I could just very much as well do the same convolutional operation over the activation maps. And then I could take that other activation map that I get, a higher level activation map, and do more convolutions over it. So um, the interesting thing is that by detecting patterns over the patterns, over the patterns, over the patterns, I can get to more complex stuff from really simple stuff. Um, so if I uh, detect in an, an edge, then I can detect uh, 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 like a corner, then I can detect like a circle, then I can detect uh, something that resembles a human eye, and then I can detect like a face. So this is kind of um, the idea of successive uh, pattern recognition over activation maps. Um, so there are some questions that remain. I mean, how do we know which filters we're going to set up? Uh, it's very easy if I tell you, okay, we have edge detector here, we have a color gradient detector here, so an, a, a bird's beak is composed by this shape and this shape, so we need to detect this and that. But um, it's impossible to actually configure those by hand for um, every possible image. So what we do here is actually we learn them. So these neural networks have like these all in internal weights that I can tune. Uh, it's like these little knobs that given the right knob configuration, I can have the network give the output that I want. So in this case, uh, these um, convolutional filters are just like particular weights inside of the network. And the network is uh, something that is called fully differentiable. So I can use an algorithm called backpropagation to actually find those filters that makes the most sense for the task that I want to perform. So if I want to do image classification, I want to detect birds or not birds, then the network will learn which are the filters in each one of the stages that are best suited for uh, performing this classification task. Another question is, how do we know how many filters in each layer? Because uh, I just showed like two activation maps, but why not five, 10, 100, 1,000? 
So um, it's a very interesting question. And actually, the answer is that there is no answer. <laughs> the answer is that this is called a hyperparameter of the network. And it's, it's, this is some fixed value that you choose beforehand. Um, it's like defining the network ar architecture, so to speak. And you actually try out what works best for your case. And, and if it doesn't, you just depending on the, uh, how much time it takes to compute. So basically, that's it. Um, Interestingly, this is how like, the um, bottom level filters look like in a real trained neural network. So if you see there, um, they kind of resemble some basic shapes and, and color gradients. And the interesting thing is that people find out, uh, found out something very, very surprising. It's actually, if in many cases that you're doing image classification, um, the networks kind of turn, turn out to learn the same basic filters in the first levels of the network, no matter what task you are performing. So if I want to classify bird, not bird, then my network I will learn something like this. But if I want to classify uh, dog, cat, then my network will also learn something like this. So this, is, this notion um, ended up being called like pre-training a neural network. So if you have like a data set with a few birds and few not birds, then um, that's not leverage uh, a network that was trained in a larger, much larger data set for a different task and use that uh, as leverage so you need less training data. So it's a very interesting notion. Um, so what does the result of a convolutional layer looks like? We have our image, 1900 by 1300 by 3. These are like uh, fake dimensions, but still it kind of looked like that. Um, by 3 because of the three color channels, red, uh, green, blue. So um, I slide one convolutional filter, and I get something that is 1900 by 1300 by 1. OK, so my activation map is uh, spatially the same dimension of the image uh, at just one pixel, because each region is summarized in one. So I do this with another filter, and I get another thing that is 1900 by 1300 by 1, and another thing, and another one, and another one. OK, so if I have like 64 filters in one layer, I would get a, a volume that is the same spatial dimensions of the image, 1900 by 1300 by, um, by uh, yeah, 1900 by 1300, and then I would get uh, a depth equivalent to the number of convolutional filters that I um, that I pick. Okay, so if I um, if I chose 64, I would get something 1900 by 1300 by 64, and that's cool. But what's the problem here? If I'm going to do this layer after layer after layer, I've actually made my problem uh, impossible to solve because I started with something that is of depth. Uh, three, and now I have something that is depth 64, and the next layer will be much deeper, and the following will be much deeper. So I will have like this ginormous, gigantic, uh, gargantuan matrix that will extract anything, anything meaningful from. So what I'm going to do here is I need a way to actually summarize the information that is present on these activation maps, so I can have something smaller that kind of summarizes the interesting things about the image that I want to know. So. This is called pooling. First, we had convolutions. We extract uh, the feature maps. Now, um, we're going to take those feature maps, and we have our volume here. And what we're going we're gonna to do is really simple. Um, each 2 by 2 region, spatially, of the feature map, we're going to take uh, each one of the four values. We're going to calculate which one is the max value in that small region. And we're going to only keep that. Okay. So for example, in this case, um, we turn each 2 by 2 spatial region into 1 by 1. So what we're going to get is if we were 1900 by 1300, now we're going to be 1950 by 850. OK, so we, ha we actually halved um, the spatial dimension. And the interesting thing uh, about this is why does this intuitively work? Why are we taking the max and not the average, for example? There is actually another pooling called average pooling, but people generally use uh, this called max pooling. So why does it work? So if you see it in an image, in a real image, so, and these are all like real visualizations uh, that I made for this talk, and I'm going to make my code open so you guys can uh, play around with it. Uh, for now, it's not released because it's very messy, but it will be, trust me. And if, and if not, just write to me and nag me until I publish. Um, but um, you take these, um, these original feature maps. So this is um, the activation map produced by only a single filter. And what we're going to do is we're going to max pool this. Uh, so in each successive step, I'm going to have the spatial dimensions. So if you see, it's going to look like more, more uh, blur blurry each time, OK? Until we get something like this, which is uh, much smaller. But here, I cannot have the, the information summarized, because I know that in this, in this particular region here, 
of, of the image, if I scale it up to the size of the image, this particular region that is light up comes from taking the max of the max of the max of the max of the activations. So I know that somewhere in that region, somewhere in that region that I'm seeing here, my filter got very strongly activated. Okay? So instead of knowing that on this single pixel my filter was activated, I now know that in an entire region my filter was uh, strongly activated. So that lets me uh, kind of summarize the image into something much smaller. Okay? Um, so yeah, basically that's it. So how does a, a convolutional neural network in the whole uh, look like? Basically, we take an image of a certain size. Then we apply a, a succession of convolutional filters. So we get uh, another volume. And then we max pool. And then we, get, uh, we apply other layers of convolutions. And then we pull comp, pull comp, pull comp, pull. Until at the end, we get something uh, that is much smaller spatially like, um, than the original image, like the max pooling example um, before. So we get something smaller spatially, but much deeper. Uh, that volume kind of encodes the information of the image in a way that's very meaningful because of the activations of the filters. So um, this is called the activation map. Like we have activation maps in each layer, but this will be like our activation map of the network because it's at the end. Um, and this I can use to feed to any classifier. So if I take my image, I take my component, I compute the activation map. Turns out that that uh, is really useful for doing classification by many, many algorithms. But as uh, we are using neural networks, we can just um, plug in uh, what's called a fully connected layer to the network. So that will do the classification for us. That will learn its own weights. Uh, so that coming from this um, volume, we get to a certain number of outputs. For example, here, um, I'm going to return one of 1,000 classes. So I'm going to turn a probability distribution that an image belongs to one of 1,000 classes. Um, so, um, so the fully connected layers of the convolutional networks uh, require a fixed sized uh, vector to, um, as, as input. So in this case, I do really need to uh, warp the image. So before I fit it to the ComNet, I, I actually make it a square, like you do in, in Photoshop. So it's the same thing. Um, and basically, what I told you about before was that people um, use these things, and they use it pre-trained on this data set called ImageNet, which is a really big data set with like 1.2 million. Um, the networks that are pre-trained in this data set can kind of know how to see in general. They, they have these generic filters that uh, let the network um, distinguish between different kind of images and calculate good features, good activation maps that can be used for classification later. So um, I had the idea of actually going uh, over the activation maps of my bird example. So uh, if I go up the network and see, OK, where, where does this uh, filter activate in the image? And I found some of the uh, filters of the example of the bird. And if you can see here, you can, you can know that uh, when it's white, it's more strongly activated. And for many of the filters, this is uh, very hard to actually know what they're doing. But in some cases, you kind of see some interesting patterns. So here, um, if we overlay the bird, you're going to see that these particular filters uh, very up in the uh, hierarchy of the network get activated in some particular regions that might be uh, bird-like. So, so if you see there, it's kind of looking at the bird's legs and, and chest. So maybe it's reacting to some textures or, or colors or, or shapes or borders or edges. Um, second filter also in the legs. Then it's, gonna lo it's, it's looking at like textures of the wings bird like filter that gets uh, activated um, whenever it sees uh, something resembling a bird, or that I would say for looking uh, at this. So if you see, um, like we have like uh, 500 of those filters, so I just handpicked the ones that looked interesting for me, but there are many others that activate in different um, features. I, for example, found some that actually activate on the stick. Um, so it's, it's interesting to actually understand what this network is doing um, in order to, after that, understand why, uh, how are we going to do object detection based on this. So uh, learning the, com the combination of filters that are activated from the activation maps make it a lot easier to find complex patterns. Because now I don't have to look at the pixels anymore. I just say, OK, if my filter 1 and my filter 2 and 3 and 4 are activated, then I have a bird. Okay? So I made my problem, my classification problem, much, much simpler. Now I have to look at combinations of these filters that the network has learned for me. 
And this, um, this makes it really, really straightforward for classification. So um, these techniques, uh, convnets were invented in the 90s, uh, in 89, actually, by Jan LeCun. So why didn't this happen in the 80s or 90s? Um, because we've had like, convnets for a while. Uh, this is Jeff Hinton, by the way, one of the founding fathers of deep learning. So why didn't it happen before? Um, actually, there's been some discussion about this in uh, earlier talks. So basically, we now have last, like this very large data set called ImageNet, which I've talked about, 1.2 million images. Before, we had like, a data set for, for playing around, but not, not uh, something like big, really big and serious like ImageNet. Um, and now, also, we have like really fast GPUs, thanks gamers. Um, and actually, these two things, the, um, the access to data, label data of, of high quality, plus uh, GPUs, uh, actually fostered the uh, research environment. So people could, um, could actually come up with algorithms and try them out and validate that they work or not in something like, that resembles um, something much bigger. So um, this was very good for research. And the GPUs made the problem computationally tractable. And these um, actually made uh, some research breakthroughs. So, so the people could find out some, some like, very simple stuff that actually made uh, the networks not work as good before, and they do work good now. So they kind of found out these things by experimentation and proposing things uh, being smart. So uh, after these theoretical advances, um, people started saying that this works. OK, let's going to build uh, libraries and frameworks to be able to leverage and to do this easier. So anybody can do it now. So we have Cafe, we have PyTorch, uh, we have TensorFlow. We have a ton of uh, machine learning frameworks now. Um, the combination of all these. GPUs, training data, uh, theoretical advances, and frameworks means that now everybody can do it, and it's like the deep learning boom. Um, so we're going to jump to object detection now. We know how to classify images. We're good at classifying images. Now what do we mean by detection? So classification was, you give me an image, I tell you a label. Now it's basically, tell me what and where for all you see. So just, um, we needed labeled data uh, for um, image classification. For object detection, we also need labeled data. So how does it look like? Basically, we have pictures. Now, instead of just saying bird, bird, uh, woman, or bicycle, it's ambiguous because there's two. So I don't know which filters are going to activate more strongly. So if I uh, feed the third image to an image classifier, it might say bird or it might say woman, and it will be right both of the times. So, um, so in this case, I actually want to draw a bounding box around the objects that I care about. Okay? So I want to localize um, where my objects are. In this case, bird, birds, woman, and bicycle. And not only want I draw a bounding box, I want to say what the objects are. Okay, so I'm going to do classification, but not at the level of the image, but at the level of the bounding boxes of the objects. Okay? And it's interesting to know that um, our definition of objects is completely arbitrary. OK? So in this case, I could have perfectly said that the stick and the door were objects for me. But if I don't care about those, then I just don't add them to the data set. OK? So um, you're going to say, OK, but do this. You can see the torso and not the legs. Well, if you label persons in your data set without the legs, then the algorithm is going to know that these are persons. But if, uh, if uh, it's never seen before a person without legs, then nah, maybe it's probably going to say that the bounding box is like, um, that, that's not a person. So, um, so this is completely arbitrary, and I just take the, um, the objects that I care about. So um, what data sets do we have for, for um, object detection? The first one was actually Pascal, which is a small data set, but had like, it's Pascal competition where people uh, compete and in order to have the best algorithm for object detection. It was one of the earliest data sets for this. Then came Coco, originally from Microsoft, which is much larger. And um, this actually made it um, state of the art of the algorithms. This is data set has like um, 80 classes, while Pascal has 20. And also, Pascal like, favors larger objects. So everything that you train on Pascal kind of um, has trouble detecting really small stuff. But in Coco, that's, uh, that's not a problem. And now, recently, Google released uh, Open Images, v1, v2, v3, and v4. And now they're doing the um, Open Images data, uh, challenge. So this Open Images is like really, really large. I'm talking about like 32 million images. And I think that it's more like 500 classes. 
Um, so if you want to detect uh, dolphins and sharks, you would actually take those examples from uh, the open images. You would, you would never train like, with the whole open images, because that's going to be like, computationally very intensive, unless you are Google. <laughs> but, um, but if you want to take some of the classes and build your own data set, then open images is like, a very, very good resource. So why do I want to detect objects? Basically, there are many applications. Um, and I don't want to mention self-driving cars here, please. Um, so I try to come up with these other ones. So the first application is counting. I can count whatever I want. I can count people. I can count cars. And basically, uh, business owners can make decisions based on that. So in this case, the parking lot can maybe set the prices, whatever, uh, depending on the number of cars that are present, and or uh, for the business, etc. In the second case here, we have a images of a CT scan of uh, lung cancer patients. So if I could uh, have a nice object detection algorithm that is uh, trained on medically accurate data for detecting tumors, then maybe I can help doctors uh, detect um, stuff faster. And maybe I can help save lives because uh, I can um, assist to medical diagnosis in an automated way so they can do more in less time. Um, and the third example is like consumer application. It's the site uh, Pinterest. And what it's actually doing is it's detecting that this woman is wearing a purse, so it has object detection for the purse. And then what you actually get are recommendations for similar purses. So you go and buy them, and they make money. <laughs> so let's see an object detection algorithm in action if uh, internet works. I hope it does. So you might recognize the streets here. This is beautiful Singapore, and this was like uh, half a block from my hotel. And this is run actually frame by frame. But if you see, it kind of works pretty good. It has like, some confusions with the uh, traffic lights over there and the building, you're going to see later. But this is where we are, we are now. I mean, for Minsky, it wasn't solved, but for now. And if you see here, it kind of detects the people inside the bus. You see? <laughs> so, so it's pretty cool. <laughs> and this is like, uh, very easy to do with the toolkit that I'm going to show you after this part. Um, so yeah, from, from not detecting birds to accurately depicting the uh, objects that are on the street. OK, we, are, we have advanced a little bit. Uh, how do I move to the other slide? <laughs> oh, there it is. OK, so how does uh, an object, a modern object detection model work? So we're going to talk about this model called Faster RCNN, which I labeled as a deep learning model, and its variants work really well. Because it's basically state of the art. It's the best performing model that we have. In particular, the one I'm going to show you is not the b super best performing model because there, had been, there has been some uh, advancements in this. But the, like, the core idea of the algorithm is the same. They just like, tweak different um, details that make it perform better. So why is it called um, faster RCNN? It's no coincidence that there was a, a fast RCNN and there was an RCNN before. Uh, so uh, they didn't think too hard about the names. Um, but basically, the, all the ideas, this is like a natural evolution, where they had this, um, the first model in 2014 really shook the research world, because it was performing like much better than everything that existed before. Um, but what happened is that it was like really, really slow. It took like one minute per image to detect the objects. And if you are like in a self-driving car, you don't want to spend one minute for each frame that the camera captures. So you need something that works a little bit faster. Um, so we got to faster RCNN. And the interesting thing is that before, in, these, um, in the first two models, um, they had like this uh, deep learning component that was augmented by a classical algorithm. So they, the model worked like in two separate parts that were kind of combined. But when getting to faster, uh, this is actually uh, what is called a fully differentiable deep learning model. That means a single deep neural network has everything and does everything. Um, so it's interesting that it can be trained um, using backpropagation end-to-end, -end, so end-to-end -end training. And it's very efficient in that sense. In a modern GPU, it can, um, this probably can run at five, six frames per second, so not too fast. There are other algorithms that are called, um, I'm going to talk about those, single stage that are much faster. So I kind of hinted with the single stage that this is a two-stage uh, object detector. So the way it works is basically we split our work in two. Um, first. We say, OK, let's take the image and let's propose regions where it might be interesting to examine further. OK? Where should we look? So instead of looking at the entire image, I just limit my search to a particular regions that might have uh, objects in them. OK? So I want to kind of um, 
discover what is background and what might be something of interest. And then the second stage actually takes those uh, region proposals and adjust them. So, so uh, we're going to take the proposal, we're going to see, is this background? OK, then I uh, threw it away. Um, is this an object? OK, what kind of object is it? And after that, I'm going to kind of adjust so it looks better like the object. Um, and finally, I get to the uh, object detection and labeling of the, uh, of the bounding boxes. So let's think about wh what are the intuitions between, uh, behind um, the detecting of objects in regions. So before, we actually said that, OK, we have our feature maps. Uh, we have our activation maps or feature maps. It's the same thing. So actually trying to look at combinations of filters. So I have my, uh, my volume with my activation maps. And as I went through uh, with the bird example, I did the same here. And I painstakingly a hundred of uh, activation maps for this image. And I took all the filters that were activating in particular regions that kind of were of my interest. For example, some filter that activated here. So I said, OK, this looks like it activates on the head of the woman. Then another filter that activated on the hands. And I, OK, I'm going to take that, this one as well, because it kind of activates only in the region that I'm interested uh, um, on. And then I did that for like the 500 and something filters um, that I had for this image. And I combined them all. OK? So I went through 500 filters. I took the ones that activate in the regions that I'm interested um, on myself, like knowing that what kind of object I want to detect. And I did that for the woman, and I did that for the bicycle. And if you see how it looks, it's like from the feature map, from this volume, we kind of have filters that activate only in the regions that we care about for each type of object, right? Because if not, it wouldn't have been possible to have something that lights up more in the bicycle and something that lights up more in the woman, OK? So this is just to show you that the information of the regions about our object, it's kind of summarized in this activation map, which filters we have to consider for each decision, OK? Um, so given this, we kind of can predict the uh, bounding boxes around the, um, around the objects. If we are smart, we can say, OK, uh, if, I, if I'm not seeing the image, but I know that this activates on bikes, I can kind of draw the rectangle, right? So let's, um, let's do something like that. How does region proposal work? Uh, OK. So basically, I'm going to take my image. Um, in this case, I'm going to draw it 2D. It, this is actually a, a volume. Don't forget that this is like a, a deep volume that is uh, smaller spatially, but much deeper than the image. Here, I'm just drawing the, uh, the parts I care about, like in the picture before. So I'm going to take one spatial position of my feature map. For example, I'm going to take this spatial position, OK? Now, imagine that I hereby pro proclaim that an object around this spatial position should look like this, OK? This is like completely arbitrary. I just made it up. This is my reference box, um, and I call this anchor. So in this case, I chose a square, but that's completely arbitrary. I could have chosen a rectangle. I could have chosen a rectangle that is wider than, uh, than taller. I could have chosen a, a taller rectangle. Uh, so this is up to me. I say, given this region, an object might be like in this box. OK? So now, I take our ground truth, that is, take the true uh, items labeled in our data set. So we have two. We have bicycle and we have woman or, or person. OK? So now, um, we're going to take our reference box. So we're going to take the blue box. And we're going to see, OK, I'm going to keep the ground truth that is closest to my reference box, given all the ground truth that I might have in this single image. So I might have like 10 objects. But I'm going to closest to my reference box. And how do I do that? I actually calculate a metric called intersection over union. Um, and this actually um, it computes the area of the intersection, divides uh, under the area of the union, and kind of gives me this, this metric. So um, in this case, the, uh, of the two uh, ground truth, this one is closer than the other one, so I take that one. And now I kind of have a, a problem that is different because now I have to learn how to adjust my blue box so it looks like the green box, okay? So I have like a regression problem. How do I learn this uh, spatial transformation that kind of adjusts the width and the height so it looks uh, like the uh, green box, okay? 
So if I do this, computers are really fast, so I can do this for every spatial position in the feature map, so not only that um, red square, but I can take this other red square, and now I can see, okay, what's the ground truth that is uh, closest to me, but I see that there are no ground truth that are closest to this position because no ground truth intersects with this reference box. So I'm going to say, okay, this reference box is like background. This, I'm going to learn from this that this doesn't resemble an object. And I'm going to learn on all this looking at a very small region of the image. So I'm going to learn how to adjust uh, the sizes just looking at like the vicinity of the region here. Okay. Um, so as I said, computers are really fast, so I can do this for every single uh, square in my uh, feature map. I can do this. And I can do this also not with um, just a square, but I can pick many different shapes for the same position. And I can do this. Um, this is exactly what the algorithm does. It's called uh, anchors. And we define nine anchors per each position. So if we draw them all, it kind of looks like this. These are, these are the centers. Uh, last image, you can see if I drew all anchors, you would see that we should be pretty well covered in the sense that if there is an object in our image, then it's going to be covered by some of the anchors. Okay. So this is like the intuition why we kind of wouldn't miss uh, small objects. Um, so basically, this gives us a resulting set of regions, potentially hundreds of, or thousands of regions. And each of these regions is associated with an objectness score that tells us uh, how likely this region is to be an object or not. Okay. So the second stage of our algorithm needs to use these regions to produce uh, the objects. So now. Think about how, what we did before. We, we took uh, a spatial position of the feature map, and we kind of looked at a small region of the image to actually adjust uh, the size. The intuition of that would be like, if, I, uh, if I'm seeing the, side, uh, the uh, seat of the bike, I can kind of estimate the size of the bike just by looking at the seat, right? Because I know how bikes look like uh, from my data set. So now, um, what I'm going to do is, uh, I'm, I'm going to actually look at the entire um, activation map of the region, OK? So this will be a high level representation of the region that uh, encodes all the useful information. So for example, in this case, the woman, I project that into my feature map. And what I got is the part of the feature map that represents uh, this woman, this region, this particular region. And from that, I have the image summarized over there. So I can know better how to adjust the bounding box and classify if that is a, a person or not. OK? So as I said before, um, the fully connected layers of the network need um, need actually to ha receive fixed size inputs. So what I, the problem that I have is that my regions are like rectangles that are, can be of any size, or so arbitrarily sized rectangles. So I need to make them a square. So I need every single region, no matter what the shape, it needs to be transformed in a square. And I do this with a process called Roy pooling. Um, I'm not going to talk about the details, but it's like really simple. Like you see in Photoshop when you take a, an image and you like um, warp it into a square. So it does the same thing. It's, it's um, bilinear interpolation. So I can take like any shape I can, take into, I can uh, turn into a square. So I get every region into something that is 7 by 7. And from this, I can actually um, feed it to a classification layer. So given this 7 by 7 uh, square, let's say, for each, each one of the regions, I can actually say what type of object is it, or is it background. And I can also um, adjust the, uh, the coordinates so it better, um, so the bounding box is more tight, a tighter fit. Okay? So the classification will give us a probability distribution between n plus 1 classes. So my, my n classes plus, OK, background, I discard this. And, um, and the regression will actually let us have tighter bounding boxes. So in summary, the faster RCNN, first we get an activation map. We use the activation map to propose interesting regions. We associate uh, an objectness score to each of the regions. So we, we keep those regions that are more likely to be an object. We limit that to 200, 500, 1,000. That depends on your problem. Um, then we classify these regions and discard those that are background and learn how to adjust the ones that are not. Okay? So this is kind of how faster RCNN works. Now we're going to talk about building a toolkit that actually does this. So we did this, uh, and we call it Luminoth. So what is Luminoth? Basically, it's an open source object detection toolkit. Um, we aim it to be a computer vision toolkit in the sense that there are many problems that we would like to include um, here, and hopefully we will. So it has support for detecting uh, objects with two different models. Uh, one is the one we just talked about, which is called faster CNN, and the other one is SSD, uh, which is much faster. But basically, a set of uh, tools monitoring, uh, evaluating the models, managing the data sets, and even deploying them. Okay? 
So the thing that we noticed when we started this was that there were several implementations of this uh, method, this faster academia like in the sense that the, it was the implementations the authors did for publishing the paper, and that's it. So it was not really maintained. Um, they didn't care about the quality of the code. They didn't care about testing. So we tried to kind of fix that. Um, so we built this. So the, um, the objective of this was basically, let's make it as simple to use as we possibly can. So instead of uh, downloading 100 dependencies and having to copy files from here to there and blah, 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 we just wanted out of the box usage. That means like with two clicks or two um, keystrokes, <laughs> maybe that's a little bit too much, but you can actually use the thing. We want it to be production ready, so if you want to deploy your, uh, your models to production, then you don't have to do uh, much else. Of course, open source, we are all the happy about to collaborate with open source projects, so why not make this open source? We also care about uh, a lot about the readability of the code, so it's heavily commented. Um, you can actually see how the, uh, the thing works, and it's, it's not like magic, it's trying to explain itself, and also extensible and modular, in the sense that if you want to add another model, you shouldn't have to rewrite everything. You can just plug it in in the uh, part of the, uh, of the computation, let's say, that makes sense. So, simplicity, you do pip install luminov, you do lumi predict video, minus k car, so that means um, take only the cars from, my, from your data set, so keep only this class. This uh, actually says downloading checkpoint, assuming accurate, and then I get something like this. So this is actually the view from our office in Uruguay. If you want to go, you're invited. <laughs> um, so yeah, very easy. Um, actually, many people think about these methods as like, oh, you did faster SCNN, you did a model. But that's actually the smallest part. You always think about the model, but uh, as it has been said in several talks before, you have to think about how do you get your data in the model in a way that's efficient. If you want to train this, you want to keep your GPU busy, so you, wanna, you, don't wanna, you don't want to be the I.O. to be your bottleneck during training, because if not, it will take like several days. So how do you make a, an efficient data pipeline to feed uh, this thing? Then, how do you visualize what, the, what it's doing? How do you visualize that the anchors are drawn in the correct uh, position? How do you visualize what the predictions, the intermediate predictions are looking like in your model as you're training? Um, how do you train? How do you debug the thing? Uh, it's, it's hard to debug these models because, for example, how, how about what if there's a bug in the region proposal network? So the RPN gives us like bogus regions. So what might happen here is that um, our accuracy might be lower, but we wouldn't notice that it's necessarily because of the RPN. Because the second stage of the model, the RCNN, might learn to adjust for bad regions. Okay? So it can actually uh, make bugs really, really hard to find because the model is like compensating for bugs that, you, that were before in your um, pipeline, let's say. So debugging is very important. Um, how do you monitor training? How do you know your loss is converging? How do you know your gradients are not exploding? Um, how do you evaluate this model? How do you calculate the metrics and benchmark against other implementations? How do you train distributedly, either on the cloud or, um, or in your computer, on one or multiple GPUs? So Luminoth has support for training on Google Cloud ML Engine. So you can train with one command. You can just boot up a, a cluster in ML Engine, and it will train for you. Um, so this is very straightforward. And also, how do you deploy these models? And last but not least, um, unit testing, which is always forgotten in this kind of problem. But we think it's very important. So uh, the faster CNN part, at least, is very well covered in unit tests. So it's actually a good resource for learning how these things work, looking at the unit test to see what it, what it does. So how do I use this? pip install, lumi help, uh, there are several commands here, each one has its own uh, help. So lumi checkpoint, I'm going to show that in a demo soon. Um, it actually downloads pre-trained models, then lumi cloud is useful for training in the cloud. Lumi dataset, you can take uh, open images and say, okay, build me a dataset of sharks and, and, and lions, or whatever. Um, eval gives you the evaluation metrics, predict uh, is obvious. <laughs> Server is, um, is actually what I'm going to show, and train, of course, does the training. So um, how do I invoke this from my Python app? It's very simple. Uh, this API will likely change because we're making a, it a, like better. But it's very simple. Now in uh, a few lines of Python code, you can have like you open your image, um, you call get checkpoint, you call predictor network, you call predict image, and you have like your uh, a dictionary with your bounding boxes and the probability of each label. Okay. So here you have the have the, the label, this is actually a bird, and it's 99% probable. Um, 
So how does the use cycle look like? Basically, if you want to do something from scratch, you would do data set transform. Um, type Pascal is because of the format that the data set is stored. And you would actually um, take your data output into a directory called LumiTrain. You would have to set up a config file, which is very simple because we provide a, a basic config file like this, a ton of parameters that you can change on this thing. And, and we provide a config file with defaults for all of them. So you only have to tweak like tiny stuff. Then you can uh, call LumiTrain. You can run TensorBoard so you can monitor how things are looking like during the training. Then you call Eval. And then you can, you're going to call Lumi Server Web, which I'm going to show you now. So if internet works, which I hope it does, let's see. Uh, OK, so I just set up uh, an instance in the cloud that has a GPU, so this will be faster. And I copied one image over there. So uh, bicycle blah, blah, blah is, is my image. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to call Lumi. This is the, um, the in sorry, work on test, my virtual M, <laughs> Lumi. So this is the, um, the command line interface to Luminoth. The, the command is called Lumi. Uh, and if internet works, oh, there it is. OK, so I'm going to call Lumi checkpoint. Lumi checkpoint. This actually is going to search for uh, what pre-trained models do I have here. Sorry, Lumi checkpoint list. OK, no checkpoints available. So I have to do Lumi checkpoint refresh. So this will actually pull. Uh, we provide pre-trained models for uh, Pascal and Coco for SSD and uh, faster. And so you see two remote checkpoints were added. So now if I do checkpoint list again, um, you're going to see that I have two, um, two checkpoints in my, um, in my index. So both are not downloaded. Okay. So if I want to get the prediction of the image, for example, I would do Lumi predict minus, minus checkpoint. Um, you have the accurate and the fast. Let's do accurate. Or, or let's do nothing first. Lumi predict um, bicycle. So I don't tell it uh, what checkpoint I'm going to use. So it should assume, OK, there it is. Neither checkpoint nor config specified, assuming accurate. So it assumes that I want to play around with the best performing checkpoint. So I say yes, and it's going to download it from, uh, from GitHub. Hopefully, this won't take too long. This is in the cloud in Amazon, so I'm not using the bandwidth over here. Uh, but yeah. Um, let's so if I had uh, specified like um, checkpoint equals uh, fast, um, then it will have downloaded another model, which is not actually SSD, uh, shot multi-box detector, which is much faster, but less accurate. So now it's working fast. Yeah, OK. So there it is. There it's, it's calling Lumi Predict. It's uh, booting the, like, the GPU, loading the pre-trained model that it just downloaded. Um, and now it should output a JSON with the uh, actual bounding boxes in the image and the probabilities as we just saw in the Python example. Um, predicting, OK, it was loading the, the model before. So if you were going to, the, there it is, OK. So I have these objects, person, 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 bicycle, 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 person, person, baseball glove, <laughs> backpack, OK. So uh, an interesting thing is that we have a web server to try this out and play like interactively, which is called Lumi Server Web. And as I'm in the cloud, I'm going to have to bind to uh, 0, 0, 0, 0 to be able to see it in my computer. This is going to boot the server web. Again, I have not specified a checkpoint, so it will assume like accurate. Uh, there it is. And now, if I go here and I say demo, oops, sorry, port go wrong. Let's see if internet works here. Bear with me. <laughs> Load a checkpoint. OK, for some reason it's not, not working. Maybe I, let me see. Uh, yeah, 
I did it right. Maybe the port 5000 isn't open in this network. Should be. No, I should use accurate. Basically, what I'm trying to show is that um, we have a web interface in order to actually play around with the, uh, with the model. So you can see what the predictions are based on how you play around with the threshold. Um, so if uh, this loads, if not, you can do it yourself. And <laughs> you trust me that it works. <laughs> yeah, maybe it's a firewall. Yeah, OK. Um, if you, um, if you say like 100% uh, probability is my threshold, then um, it's going to detect like nothing. And if I go lower, lower, lower to, uh, to zero, it's going to take like many, many boxes of things that are not even there. So that is like a way to play around with the uh, probabilities and, uh, and be sure about what is the threshold that I care about when detecting objects. But yeah, internet is uh, playing, playing around with me, so it's not going to work. But um, Let's continue here. So if you want to learn more about this, uh, I put some links here. Uh, you can follow our blog, Triolabs. We post a lot of things about machine learning. Uh, there are some articles, actually, that go uh, deeper into the uh, details of this algorithm. Um, it was very popular, um, one of the, those blog posts. So uh, this was more like intuitive explanation of the regions and such. The other is like, I kind of understand how comnets work and such. How is this implemented in a really efficient way? So you can go read that. If you want to learn like deep learning and machine learning in general, I cannot recommend uh, strongly enough the Stanford course CS 231N. Um, I don't know if you have an equivalent here at this university, but it's like the single greatest course of deep learning I have ever seen. Um, and it's actually the one that um, kind of pushed so many people into the, uh, into the field. Also, the, the Bible of deep learning and modern deep learning by Joshua, um, by Ian Goodfellow, Joshua Bello and Aaron Corville. This is a book. And uh, this site is pretty interesting, the Still Pub. If you haven't heard about it, it's a, a site that actually tries to um, boil down these concepts of, uh, it, of research and how to uh, explain them in an, um, an intuitive way. So it's a very, um, very good site for you to check out. There are many more links that I probably missed, but you can write me as usual. And thanks for listening. You can follow me on Twitter, follow my company. This is the GitHub Illuminoth. I invite you to contribute. And thank you very much. I take questions if there's, if there's time. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, the talk was a bit longer than I thought. <laughs> but I'm sure everybody wants to have breakfast. But let's have, a, let's have two questions. I mean, does everybody, anybody have a question? Yes, we have one here. Thank you, Ivan. It's a fantastic talk. Thank you. Yeah. I'm working in uh, CV, computer vision and object detection. And one thing, I'm I just curious, have you tried the, the two-state, the, the newly two-state measure, light height uh, detection? Light height. Then another... Which one, sorry? Light height. Light height. Yeah. I haven't heard about that. A very faster one, uh, recently published, but I cannot uh, reproduce the results. Uh -huh. I, I just want to ask you. Uh, another thing is uh, YOLO. YOLO 2 and YOLO 3 mm -hmm. are very faster. And uh, YOLO 3's result is fantastic. So uh, I, I'm wondering if you have tried or not. Because yeah. the faster than 5 to 6 uh, FPIs on your Tesla mm -hmm. is still slow. Yeah, it's slow. for it's, it's not like meant for real time. It's meant for when you need more accuracy. Um, it's like whenever a paper comes out, uh, the authors claim that it's the best detector independent review. They found out that uh, faster or the successor like RetinaNet actually works better in, term, in terms of actual um, not runtime performance, but actually the, the detection performance. So uh, it, this is the case in YOLO v3. I think it's still surpassed by RetinaNet, which is two stage. Uh, it's difficult to make a single stage method that actually outperforms uh, the two stage because of some technical sti things, but we're getting closer. I mean, YOLO v3 is definitely one that you should check out, yeah. OK, one last question. Everybody wants to have breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Okay. Thank you for your talk. No worries.